self-sabotaging. I don't think it's a thing. I think as a society, we just, we love to blame people for their own challenges, don't we? That's called ableism. It's a thing. I feel like I need to make up a song about this. We do this at home, part of our PDA nature. We make up songs about our challenges. I don't want to talk to you today because you hurt my feelings and you're a dear. But we need to make one up about ableism. <laughs> A lot of people say um, that when somebody really wants to do something and then they're unable to do it, that they might be self-sabotaging. Self-sabotage, the concept itself is really interesting to me. I feel like as much as people might think that it's a gentle expression, I find it quite harsh, to be honest, because when we say that somebody is self-sabotaging, we are placing the blame, we're holding them responsible for their not being able to do something. Sometimes we might say that a person's um, self-sabotage comes from their trauma or comes from something that they're not facing about a situation. When we think about self-sabotage in that way, if it is a result of trauma or not being able to be confronted with something, then there's no intention there. There can't be intention. Anything that is a result of trauma has been a reprogramming of our neurobiology. So when a person is traumatized, there's a rewiring process that goes on in the brain otherwise we wouldn't have resulting challenges from that trauma so when we tell somebody oh you're just not going to the gym today because you're self-sabotaging I don't know it has the same impact on me as though somebody call, called another person lazy I don't believe in laziness I think there's always really really important reasons for people not being able to do things not that they're self-sabotaging self-sabotage sounds like we are intentionally making lives hard for ourselves because we're self-loathing now this is just my personal take on the situation but I want to compare it to my own experience so when I think about my own individual experience as somebody with a PDA profile or subtype of autism I guess oh, I don't even like to say that I'm an autistic person I'm also ADHD. I also have CPTSD, Complex Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, PDA, Pathological Demand Avoidance, but I prefer to call it Persistent Drive for Autonomy, Extreme Anxiety that Drives an Inherent Need for Extreme Autonomy. <laughs> Now, I know now at the age of 42 that if I am unable to participate in something that I want for myself or that somebody else wants for me, my experience is that more often than not, that's going to be a result of demand avoidance. That is completely different to self-sabotage. Even saying that it's different when I don't really know if self-sabotage is a thing, there is self-preservation involved with not being able to do things. So if we look at a person who has a background of trauma and they're unable to get up on stage and engage with public speaking because they had an experience when they were younger where they were bullied for public speaking or because they have extreme anxiety and they don't feel like they can do public speaking. That's not self-sabotage, that's self-preservation. So anxiety is something that's been in our family for a really long time. My extended family, there were always ongoing conversations about anxiety, probably in very different ways than how we talk about it in my immediate family. We as a family try not to demonize anxiety. We try and understand that there is a purpose for it. That doesn't mean that we don't hate its guts sometime. Anxiety, the purpose of anxiety is to self-preserve. And according to you know, the individual and the experiences they've had, their neurobiology, their neurodivergence, their environment, how safe they feel or how safe their brain perceives they are. Because also I think it's important to separate what we've come to understand as feeling. Do I feel safe? 
Sometimes I don't know if I feel safe. Does my brain perceive that I'm safe? Totally different thing. Taking a person who cannot do public speaking because they've been bullied, that anxiety that prevents them from being able to do so comes from the amygdala. It comes from a very important neurobiological process that we have to keep us alive. Now that part of the brain doesn't care for detail. It doesn't care that it's just public speaking. It doesn't care um, whether it's just doing homework. It doesn't care for the difference between being chased by a wild animal and having to have a courageous conversation or a scary conversation with somebody or stand up for myself. The brain doesn't differentiate based on details. The brain, the amygdala, the threat response works in accordance with our experiences and our neurobiology. So one person might might be able to do public speaking because they can for whatever reasons. The other person has a myriad of experiences where they can't. The most important contributing factor to whether we can or cannot engage with something, especially when we're neurodivergent, is the threat response. I don't get to decide. I don't get to choose what my threat response is elevated or escalated over. For me, it's what it decides is going to keep me alive or not. And if I am demand avoidant, if I am a PDA, and this is just about my identity, if I am that person with a PDA profile and I'm unable to engage with something, it's not because I'm self-sabotaging. It's because my brain has perceived threat and believes I will die. I will literally lose my life if I engage with this thing like public speaking. So it's not about self-sabotaging. I think it's really harmful to people when we say you're self-sabotaging. It's really, really harsh. An example for me that's made me think about this is sometimes, you know, I've learned to go with the flow of my PDA. If I'm unable to engage with something, I'm forced to just accept that. And when the time is right or the moment comes up for me, then I can do the thing I've been wanting to do. If I think about it too much, if I get too excited. Another example of the threat response to the amygdala, that part of the brain that scans the environment. Another example of that not caring for details or not differentiating between experiences is that it confuses excitement with anxiety. If I get too excited about something I really want to do, then my threat response goes up and prevents me from engaging with that thing because it thinks anxiety, anxious, meaning there's danger. The brain goes, my job here is to keep my person alive, so I'm going to do everything in my power to stop them from doing this thing. Let's think about children who are school avoiding. Now we, we say school refusing. I think that's unhelpful because there are so many children who want to be in a school environment, especially when we're talking about our PDA children, demand avoidant children, highly anxious children. They want to be, so many of them, not all of them, want to be in a school environment because they are really socially motivated, really socially driven, want to be around their peers, want to be learning, but they're unable to get themselves to school. Sometimes they're unable to get in the car. Over time, it might build to the point where they're unable to get out of bed. And then they may be unable to even go to bed because that brain, that threat response is very good at recognizing a pattern, a sequence of events that leads to the threat. So we might be able to get to the school gate for six months and then we might only be able to get to school but not able to get out of the car. We're taking away a step every few months, every few weeks, every few days, whatever it is, because the threat response says, I know better Better than you and I've got this. I've got this. Our children are not self-sabotaging and I don't believe that adults are self-sabotaging. I think sometimes we have very little information and insight about our neuro, our neurobiology, our neurodivergence. We give ourselves a hard time. So for me, I wanted to focus on my health this year and I am focusing on my health. But anytime I say I'm going to insert the thing here, my de demand avoidance threat response just jumps in and goes, no, we're not doing anything new. No, new things are not safe we only do what's familiar and then if it becomes too familiar we're going to kick up a stink about that too and not be able to do that so I decided that I would sign up for some online personal training because I want to strengthen my core <laughs> 
From the moment I signed up, I knew this could go one of two ways. I can try or PDA says no. It's like computer says no. I met with my personal trainer, established a great relationship, connected really, really well, and then came away, told myself, don't think about this too much. Don't think about the exercising too much, Christy. And then it becomes, don't think about not thinking about the exercise. And then it becomes, don't think about not thinking about not thinking about the exercise. But it was there. I was excited. I was imagining what it would be like to not be chronically ill all the time and have a strengthened core and to feel good. And I was in my dreaming about it and my threat response was up. Up came the day where I was supposed to start these exercises that I was really excited to start in the morning my brain jumped in and said, we'll do this a bit later. We'll do this after breakfast. And then breakfast came and went. That threat response had me feeling quite fatigued. And then I developed a migraine. It looks from the outside as though people with demand avoidance or high anxiety are making up that we're unwell to get out of things. It looks like we're pretending that we have a migraine to get out of things. It looks like we're making excuses to get out of things. But what happens is the brain is very, very clever and it finds pathways to keep us alive. And sometimes we are held hostage to that process. All we can do, especially when we're children and we lack that insight into our neurology, all we can do is go along with what the brain is commanding. And so when we're asked, when are you going to do that exercise? Or when are you going to get that homework done? Or when are you going to get up for school? We're going to say things like, I'll do the exercise after breakfast. Or I can't get up. I can't can't get out of bed today. And we're telling the truth. We are telling the truth. But as a society, we've been so conditioned to think the worst of people and to make assumptions based on what things look like on the outside, their behavior. So when a person says, I really want to do this exercise routine, and then they feed a bunch of reasons or plans that sound like excuses, like I'm gonna do it after breakfast, I'm gonna do it after lunch, okay, I'll do it tonight when, when the children are in bed and then it doesn't happen. Whew. Let me tell you what it's like for the individual that it doesn't happen for. You are so down and out. You're so self-loathing sometimes. And when you don't know your demand avoidant or highly anxious or a PDA or ADHD, executive functioning, whatever is going on, when you don't know about that, all you have left to interpret and translate is that you're just crap, that you can't do things, that you're making excuses. And so begins the internalized ableism and the internalized process of self loathing and self-rejecting. So you give yourself a hard time, but on top of that are other layers like the outside world. Well, my parents are going to be angry at me and what am I going to tell them? Well, my teachers are going to be mad because I didn't do my homework. Well, I'm going to fail this exam because I can't pick up my pen to do it, even though I know I could get an A. These are all very real experiences for PDAs. People often, more often than not, respond by feeding back to us that we're not being honest that we're making excuses, that we need to try harder in our best trying and our best doing. So that is not self-sabotage. It is self-preservation that we are not in control of. All I have to do sometimes is think about something that makes me feel a lot of joy and really excited about, like planting a garden, cooking an incredible meal, my favorite food, doing anything that makes me feel happy and excited. The minute I think about it and get excited, sometimes demand avoidance shows up and it's baffling to those around me because they'll be so confused by why won't be able to do a thing that makes me so happy. And this is what demand avoidance is. It's not just about us not being able to comply with instructions or requests or suggestions. Demand avoidance is also something that means that we cannot engage with our our own interests and things that we want to do for ourselves. So when my children or anybody in my life with a PDA profile says to me, yes, I would like to come with you and 
spend some time taking photos in nature. I know that they mean it. In that moment, I know that they mean it. But if when I reach out and say, hey, the day's come, still interested? If I don't hear from them, I let it go. I radically accept. If they don't come out of their room, if it's one of my children, I let it go and I radically accept. Because I know that sometimes PDAs are grieving. Grieving that they don't have what we expect from them. They can't feed back to us a reason. Sometimes as PDAs we can't say, well I really want to do this photography but you know I have demand avoidance so like I'm explaining to you now, children can't do that. Children can't do that. What they can do is feel incredibly threatened and frightened and so they will respond or react with, with irritability, sometimes aggression, with um, outlandish behaviours, with distraction, with diversion, with pleading and sometimes hurting themselves because they are so distressed about why they can't do the thing that seems to be so simple. We are in a society where we are conditioned to always have reasons, to always be able to explain or make sense of why we have particular behaviours, but also we tend to be really fixated on the behaviour and not really that interested in delving a little bit deeper. But you're smarter than that. You know you won't die, is what I get told. If only it was up to our thinking. I think this is why so many people who um, are disabled in whatever way take real issue with that toxic positivity. Think your way out of situations. Think positive. Rationalise yourself out of disability. <laughs> I'm, that doesn't mean that we can't work on some of our challenges if that's what we choose for ourselves. We don't, we don't rationalise ourselves out of very real disabilities. If our children are demand avoidant, in particular PDA, they will always be that way. Sometimes people um, will talk about the things that they're implementing in their children's lives or in their own lives, like changing the environment and all that sort of stuff, and sometimes their children don't change, and that's because we will always be demand avoidant by nature. Nature. It is an inherent, powerful, self-preserving neurobiology for me. That doesn't mean that I don't hate its guts sometimes too. <laughs> I do, I do. But I wouldn't change it. But I think there is definitely an important distinction to be made between self-sabotaging. I don't think it's a thing. I think as a society we just we love to blame people for their own challenges don't we that's called ableism it's a thing i feel like i need to make up a song about this we do this at home part of our pda nature we make up songs about our challenges i don't want to talk to you today because you hurt my feelings and you're a dear but we need to make one up about ableism have a wonderful day